Today, we are celebrating the 250th anniversary of the writing of the hymn text, a hymn that we now know as Amazing Grace. This is the logo that I received from Creative Communications quite some time ago. They were advertising this special celebration and they wanted us to get resources for celebrating the hymn. And I checked with some of the people on our, our worship team and they said, yes, this is a really good thing to do. And I thought there's really no better way for us to start the new year than to give thanks and to celebrate the amazing grace of our God. We need to stop and realize that we are blessed every moment by God's grace. You've heard the phrase, Jesus is the reason for the season. And I thought we could also say that grace is the reason for the season of Christmas. We know that the season of Christmas continues through our celebration of Epiphany, which for us will be next Sunday. But during this season, we've been focusing on the gift of our Savior. A lot of you may know at least parts of the story behind the hymn, Amazing Grace. But I pray that as we meditate on this great hymn, that we will be filled once more with our gratitude for the grace of our God. The hymn text was written by a man named John Newton, who was an Englishman. He was known as a poet, and he became uh, a clergy in the Church of England. He wrote the words to this hymn to accompany a sermon he was scheduled to preach on New Year's Day in 1773. You may wonder why the hymn, why the scripture that Lauren has read for us. This is the scripture text on which Newton based the hymn. First Chronicles chapter 17. The prophet Nathan has brought to King David this word of promise from God that of all the people on the earth, God has chosen King David and his lineage, his house. When Newton first published his hymn, it was called First Chronicles 17, 16 to 17, Faith's Review and Expectation. Amazing grace is much easier, isn't it? In this scripture, as King David hears this word from the prophet, the promise of God, he expresses humility. Who am I, Lord God? And what is my house that you have brought me thus far? David is overwhelmed by God's goodness shown to him. He's humbled and he feels unworthy. John Newton uses this scripture then to jump into writing about his own life and his own life-changing experience of God's grace. In his earlier life, he says that he was much like the prodigal son in Jesus' parable. He was far from faith, and he would not listen even to his own father's pleading. You may have noticed in the scripture that Newton borrows this phrase from King David, brought me thus far for the hymn, but he adds the word safe because of his experience of the dangers of the sea and his trust that God would bring him home safely. It was a harrowing event in his life that brought Newton near to God. In 1748, while he was serving as a sea captain of a ship in the Atlantic slave trade, a violent storm off the coast hit 
the ship. And so he was in danger of losing his life. And in that moment, he calls out to God for mercy. In this moment, Newton finally turns to God and he calls this the hour I first believed. In that moment, Newton dramatically experiences the transformative power of God's grace. And he is a changed man. Although I read that that first experience didn't really stick with him. He kind of, as we say, backslid a little bit, went back to his old ways. And then another near death experience caused him to make the change permanent. He decides to leave sailing behind. He begins to study for the ministry. And as a pastor, he begins to write hymn texts. Newton has experienced that God's love does not give up on anyone, not even on him. And he feels blessed by the mercy of Jesus Christ's saving grace. We're reminded of this scripture verse recorded in Titus chapter two, for the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. Now, Newton begins to write the words for the hymn that will become known as Amazing Grace in December of 1772, and he is 47 years old. We love that opening line, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. What does the sound of grace sound like to you? How would you describe the sound of grace. Have you ever stopped to think about it? In the Gospel of John, we learn in the prologue in the first chapter that Jesus Christ is the word of God. And in Jesus, we can hear the sound of redemption. We experience the sound of the saving voice of God singing in our own lives. And yet, in order to hear that sweet sound, we must confess our need of God's forgiveness and God's saving grace. As Newton experiences that sweet sound, he looks at his past behavior and he looks at his past life and he has many regrets. And he is horrified that he participated in the slave trade, and he could see the error in the way he had turned his back on God in the past. And so Newton uses a word from scripture to describe himself, a wretch. It's taken from Romans chapter seven, verse 24. Newton calls himself a wretch, but he also acknowledges that he is like the prodigal son in Jesus' parable, he was lost, and then he is found in God's grace. Just like in the parable, the forgiving and loving father celebrates because his son was lost and now is found. The other scripture reference here in this verse is from the Gospel of John, a place where Jesus heals a man who had been blind. And the people around this man begin to ask questions about Jesus. And they ask this man, is Jesus a sinner? And the man replies that he does not know, but he does testify to what he does know. I once was blind, but now I see. The change in John Newton's life is so dramatic that he relates to these two persons in the teachings of Jesus. 
Then in the second verse of the hymn text, Newton references the moment he experiences God's grace. grace. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. Does this line take you back in your own memory? It can call us to remember and to be grateful for how we received the grace of God first in our lives. Our anchor of hope is firmly tethered to Jesus. When I was being ordained an elder, my mother embroidered symbols for me that a member of the church after my mother's death made into a stole for me. And thinking about different symbols, I chose an anchor because for me, it was a reminder that my life is anchored in Christ and in his never failing grace. As we move to the third stanza, stanza of Newton's text, it speaks of the trials and tribulations through which God has brought him. His grace has brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. Grace is what brings us to faith, and it is what will ultimately be our ending place. In the past, people have asked me, what is distinctive about United Methodism? If you had to sum it up in one word, can you imagine somebody asking me to use only one word? But here's the good one, right? Grace. To me, that's really what I believe we emphasize as United Methodists. John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, wrote extensively about grace, and he practiced it in his own life. And indeed, our faith is dependent on God's grace. Through, great, through faith, grace is the first morning word, the word at midday, and the last word at night. When I saw this quote, I thought, how would my day go if I began with the first word in the morning, a word grace, and then to pause at the middle of the day, and again, return to that word grace, and at the end of the day, that the last word from my lips would be grace. You might want to try that in your own routine. Now, when I talk about grace, I can't help but remember our dog, whose name was Grace. Some of you have heard me talk about Grace. We miss her a lot. But there was just something about saying her name that always kept me in check. I would get angry with something she had done, and I would go to raise my voice and the Holy Spirit would like put a hand over my mouth. I just couldn't yell the word grace at the dog, right? The word is rich with meaning for us. And I also began to think, what if in every encounter with another person, before I said their name or said anything else, just said in my mind, grace, that I would extend grace to others. Some of us are very hard on ourselves. And what if I spoke to myself a word of grace? It was knowing the grace of God in his life that caused John Newton to change. He began to treat others differently. He was deeply ashamed of his participation in the slave trade. And in a pamphlet Newton wrote in the year 1788, he said this, it will always be a subject of humiliating reflection to me that I was once an active instrument in a business at which my heart now shudders. Newton acted 
on his feeling of regret. And he spoke out and he preached against slavery. And some of you may know that he influenced William Wilberforce to continue the fight for an end to slavery in England. Slavery exists today. We now usually use the term human trafficking. And the month of January is a time to bring awareness to this evil. And I have a very personal experience in my work at the Board of Child Care, where we worked with young people who had become victims of human trafficking. While I was there, it was my honor to work with them and to extend God's grace to them. For another group of our young people, they had never heard or been raised in the faith. They didn't know. And so they wanted this clean start in their lives. And I was very honored and humble to officiate at baptisms for some of the young people. After one such baptism, a, a young woman came up to me and I could tell she was all excited and she couldn't quite focus to get the words out. But she said, Reverend Stacy, I feel new. I feel new. That was her experience of God's grace in baptism. It is an amazing grace that we should be the recipient of such grace is beyond words. And John Newton wrote about this amazing grace with such beauty. Now, in particularly in those days, the words were often written first and then set to a tune. And so it was that this hymn text was a poem that he recited in his sermon. And then it was set to many different melodies over the years. And the tune we know best would not even be written for another half a century. The hymn was not as popular in England, but it became very popular here in the United States. And it was an American composer who would set it to the tune we now sing today. You'll note that in our hymnal, there is a sixth verse. It was not written by John Newton, but it was added later as a fitting doxology to God's ever abundant and amazing grace. And we will sing that verse to close our worship today. So much of this historical information I found through uh, resources and research, it is a fascinating story, the development of this hymn. And I believe that each of us will have personal reflections and maybe memories, testimonies to God's amazing grace. As we begin this new year, may we truly be grounded in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.